the recorder. Okay. I'm not the only one who saw that, right? <laughs> you you said it. I did it. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I've got nothing on that. Um, All right. <laughs> see, we're waiting for Albert to join us. Uh, Dr. Taylor, I see you here. And just bear with us while Albert comes in. Yeah, Anastasia, that was pretty interesting, pretty eventful. Some really nice art. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I see oh. the art. <laughs> uh, let's give about one more minute for Albert. Albert, just jump in. Here we go. Okay, we're going to get started. So, <clears throat> welcome everyone to B4 Deep Dive Intersectional Equity and XR. This is a XR Access Symposium deep dive, and we're so happy to have you with us. I'm happy to be here along with my fellow moderators, Dr. Valerie Jones-Taylor, Associate Professor, Department of Psychology and Africana Studies at Lehigh University. Also have Albert Kim of Accessibility Next Gen. Me, I'm Christopher Lafayette, who's also a third of the moderators that are here today. We are going to chop some wood and explore on several different discussions and different layers. We're gonna go beneath the surface. We're gonna catch and talk about a lot of different things. How we'll open this up is that we'll hear from Dr. Taylor, and then we'll hear from Albert, and they will share what they are currently focused on in relation to what we're doing. And I will take time to speak then we want to hear from all of you, any questions or any things that you'd like to share as we move forward in this deep dive discussion. We'll now turn this over to Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor. Yes, um, thank you all. Thank you uh, for being here. And Chris, thank you for the introduction. So I'm Valerie Taylor and I come here as a social psychologist. I do research on interracial interactions sort of broadly, um, what makes them go well and what makes them fall apart with a particular focus on how negative stereotypes about different racial groups can really undermine the positive benefits of engaging in cross-race or interracial interactions. So I more recently um, came to apply this interest to VR in the last um, three to four years. And I've really been interested in how we can use VR as one technical approach to improving challenging interracial interactions via repetition and focused practice. And so I have a, a grant that I work on that with um, collaborators. And in doing this work, it meant that I had to begin thinking a lot about people's identities and their representation in VR of themselves, of others. And in my case, it was specifically race and ethnicity. Wait, and wait, 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 Can you guys hear me? Okay, all right. Um, particularly uh, about race and, and gender to start. And so I really um, exam have come to examine how racial bias unfolds in virtual environments and how we can mitigate it. And so with this research, I came to know a series of other researchers in um, the XR um, environment more generally at different universities that had also been thinking about how people are engaging across different identities in the VR space and how they represent themselves, um, how they are using the hardware and the challenges that they may have using the hardware. And with all this in mind, we have come together to propose this really large grant, this community-based grant, um, after talking with a lot of researchers and people enthusiastic in the VR community to develop an infrastructure to really help researchers develop and carry out human subjects experiments in VR. And it's 
um, a project that we call VERA, which stands for the Virtual Experience Research Accelerator. And so VERA is the acronym. And our goal is really to have a turnkey mechanism for obtaining high quality research and results that we can share with the larger community. The other large goal of this project is to have a very large, diverse, and dedicated standing pool of VR study participants and researchers who can easily access these participants because, um, as I was in another session earlier, and as we uh, know from VR work, that there are differences among people who are just coming to VR and people who have used it and have um, and that practice effect is over and wanting to know what some of the um, outcomes are for different phenomenon for different communities in VR. And so we're really excited about um, this accelerator that we hope to launch, um, of course, in the next year. And so researchers will have access to Vera um, using a dashboard where they can propose studies, they can find collaborators, hopefully they can um, actually implement these studies and access the data. Of course, we know uh, many researchers often want an embargo period on their own research, but over time we will release the work for the larger community and make it publicly available. And so we've just been talking to a lot of people about what they would want to see from this sort of accelerator. And right now we're hoping to um, we have a large group of people from ethnically and racially diverse backgrounds, people with um, for, with different ability abilities in the pool as well, genders as well as people from different socioeconomic status. And of course, we know that all these identities intersect. Um, people often have more than one of these identities, and so it's been really important for us to collaborate with different groups to ensure that um, we have representation across all these different sectors. And so I'll just stop by um, shouting out uh, the, the collaborators who I've worked with. Um, they include uh, the, the lead PI, Gregory Welch from the University of Central Florida, Tabitha Peck at Davidson College, um, Jeremy Balinson um, from Stanford University, and um, Professor Shiri Azenkoke, excuse me if I misspoke um, the name, from Cornell Tech, and um, she's with XR Access and uh, Tyler Wren with IDXR Workstream. And so we've worked with a large team to really begin to pull this together. And I look forward to hearing some of your thoughts or comments about what you would like to see or what might be interesting about this idea to really open it up, to have, um, again, both diverse participants as we run different uh, research studies here and want to really generalize this, these results more broadly and also um, diverse creators of content and research studies themselves. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. We really appreciate you sharing this and we're looking forward to hearing more. Albert, we'd like to hear what, what you have to express today. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Chris, for introducing me. Um, my name is Albert Kim. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I'm an Asian man in 30s. Um, I, I have cognitive and learning disabilities as well as mental health disabilities myself. Um, I work as an accessibility consultant and trainer. Uh, most recently, I worked at, uh, as a UX accessibility lead at Corn Ferry and accessibility is me with uh, as ServiceNow uh, in their design system team. Um, I'm passionate about advocating for especially uh, people in the neurodiverse uh, diversity community um, and including mental health into uh, digital accessibility conversations more. Um, traditionally, uh, these invisible disabilities have been uh, uh, ignored subject uh, in, in uh, accessibility conversations. And there hasn't been too much conversations around this. And I'm uh, part of a W3C COGA task force team, Cognitive and Learning Disabilities Task Force team, where we work on um, building accessibility, uh, researching and building accessibility guidelines and supplemental guidelines uh, for, uh, for designers, developers to and product managers and uh, uh, everyone involved in the product uh, development cycle to 
design and develop products accessibly for not just for people with physical disabilities, but also for people with um, uh, invisible disabilities. Um, and besides that, uh, I also run a grassroots community called Accessibility and Next Gen uh, for uh, people who are interested in learning more about digital accessibility and uh, don't know where to begin. Um, I myself, uh, when I started uh, learning and getting into digital accessibility, it was very challenging because uh, I couldn't really find a, a community um, that was focused on uh, people who are starting out. Uh, I actually went through Teach Access Study Away program um, when I was beginning, uh, but after the program ended, the community kind of uh, died down for, for the uh, people who are uh, students who are involved in that program. So once I got into this field, I, I uh, started this community accessibility next gen and we now have about 500 members uh, uh, globally and um, uh, 49 volunteers uh, helping me out with this. And we are not sponsored or uh, there's no payment, it's all free. Uh, uh, we are not sponsored by a specific company or anything, not tied to anything. And it's all just volunteer organization where we try to bridge the gap between uh, the generational gap in accessibility. Uh, most of leaders, um, in accessibility are, are uh, have been in the field for a long time and uh, tend to be uh, white male um, in 50s or 60s. Um, so we are trying to bring in more diversity into uh, the actual people who are uh, working on accessibility. So a lot of people who are uh, uh, involved in our community are uh, have disabilities themselves uh, come from multicultural uh, uh, areas and uh, 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 diverse um, uh, backgrounds. So last year, we actually uh, launched a mentorship program uh, and it happened to gain a lot of attention. Um, we paired up uh, about uh, 368 uh, participants uh, to in the mentorship program. Um, and 60% of them were in America's region, 32% was EMEA and 8% APAC. So um, that's something that I also do. And um, uh, with the W3C uh, Kuga Test Force team, I, I forgot to mention that I'm uh, after I joined, I started the uh, mental health subgroup so we also not only research about uh, accessibility guidelines for people with cognitive and learning disabilities, but also mental health uh, disabilities. Um, I, because I come from design background, I, I, I care a lot about design equity, inclusive design, um, especially because I have, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the neurodiversity community and uh, I'm very passionate about mental health due to my personal struggles. And I'm an Asian man uh, from South Korea. So um, I, I'm very passionate about DEI and accessibility in terms of multiculture, um, including uh, different socioeconomics, um, non-native English speakers, uh, things like that. So when it comes to XR, VR, AR, um, uh, these are, uh, uh, I, and these are very crucial uh, uh, factors that we need to include and start thinking about uh, rather than just thinking about physical disabilities or limited uh, diversity and equity. Um, so um, that's where I come and um, uh, hopefully uh, I can share uh, and have a good conversation here um, talking about um, invisible disabilities, as well as a uh, multicultural aspect of um, uh, making uh, VR and AR uh, accessible uh, and inclusive. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Albert. And we really enjoyed what you had to say thus far, and we're looking forward to hearing more. Once again, my name is Christopher Lafayette, third moderator of the trio here. Happy to be with you all. Founder of Gatherverse, and I'll talk a little bit about what I do as far as when it comes to Gatherverse platform and then with some other things, and then we'll roll into some Q&A 
and we'll explore from there further and go a little bit deeper. With Gatherverse, last year I came out with what's now known as the seven standards of the metaverse, and which is a humanity first to the metaverse itself. Little did I know that it would take off the way it's taken off. Uh, I've seen an IEEE and a lot of other different locations that you can find a lot of people that are building humanity first standards towards the metaverse of general technology as it is, and including the XR ecosystem. Uh, the standards are humanity first, uh, being the first, and then second is accessibility, third education, and then it leads on to equality, community development, safety, privacy, and wellness. The reason that I architect the seven standards of the metaverse is because I just thought it was pertinent and appropriate now that we venture off and now that we've become more virtual in the past 26 months than we have the past 26 years, I thought it prudent with the advent rise of the conceptual and very early metaverse that I thought it was important for us to always keep in mind the consideration as to why we've been building hardware and software content for all these many decades is for humanity. And that if we don't have more inclusive people, part of the process of building the metaverse. In other words, if we do not have the greater contribution of humankind, then if we're going to extend reality, then we must bring reality with it. And if we don't bring reality with it, then what is it that we're actually building? You know, we tend to take extended reality XR acronym and we say, okay, we're going to create virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. But the reality is, is that it's only built by a few and it needs to be well represented from not just no matter the color, no matter the gender, but the culture, right? The culture contribution matters. The more culture that you have involved ecologically in ecosystem development, moving, if you will, from a more monocultural perspective, shifting from that lens to a polycultural perspective, the more culture that you have introduced to the ecosystem, the stronger that ecosystem becomes. And so what we want to do is be mindful of who are the people that are having an opportunity to adopt, adapt, and build these platforms. Now, why is accessibility the second standard that we have following humanity first in the seven standards of the metaverse? And you can go see some more of this on gatherverse.org, by the way. The reason that we have accessibility is how can you get to the metaverse if you don't even know what it is? And how do you access the metaverse if you don't know how to get there? And when we start to talk about identifying what the actual metaverse is, a lot of people have a different understanding and example of it. So on one narrative and one lens, when we talk about accessibility, it's how do I access the metaverse? in terms of what is it. Second, on the other side of accessibility is when I do find myself at the threshold or at the door of the metaverse, this device that I'm about to use to access the metaverse, was this device only meant for the person that built it? Was it only meant for him or her? or if I'm part of the disability community, did they also keep in consideration when they were making this device, is it also available for people like me? And the reality is, is that where we find ourselves today with all that's been developed through the Asian dispensations, when it comes to technology and where we're at with the progenerative and very game-changing metaverse, which will be the engine for Web3. Now that we find ourselves in this particular situation, we're at a threshold where the technology has become more advanced than the technologists. And in a lot of ways, what I've explored and seen from around the world and have been there, and especially coming here where I'm presently at Silicon Valley and have been here for over 15, 20 years, what we're seeing is, is that there's a disconnect between a manifold number of communities and culture as to exactly what is the specific use case and how this will benefit for public and private sector and how this will benefit for people in their general lives when it comes to accessing hyper-realistic immersive simulated environments. 
Now, what makes this discussion so important and what Gatherverse has seeked and strived to do is this past February, we had a massive event. We had over 10,000 attendees, over 80 speakers, and they wanted to come together and say, we want to know more about the metaverse, but we also want to talk about it. And we just didn't pack the rooms full of technologists. We made sure that we got people from all different types of backgrounds that can talk about what their lens is and how they look at the metaverse or XR. And they were able to share with us from their lens where we might be headed and what they would like to see in the importance of humanity first standards. The reason that accessibility is number two on the seven standards of the metaverse is because without accessibility, you don't have education. There won't be opportunity for equality, community development, safety, privacy, and wellness. Now, once there's accessibility, and we create a more wide range of opportunity for people to access the XR ecosystem or the metaverse, the very next thing that happens in ingress is education. And what we mean by that is as soon as I find myself in a, let's say a virtual world, and I've accessed this virtual world, immediately what I begin to do is fall into what we call perceptual science. Mm -hmm. Scanning and understanding and educating myself on the actual environment that I'm ingressing into now that I have greater access and I'm able to access this space. Once I have greater access into this virtual nascent world or this virtual populated world or existence or space. Once I go into this hyper realistic immersive simulated environment or this immersive simulated environment, I begin to educate myself on what it is and where I find myself at presently at the moment. That leads into the third standard, which is education. After education will come equality. Because now that I'm sitting here and in this space, I have to ask myself, is this a place where I want to be? And do I belong? How many times have we gone into a restaurant and we looked around and said, eh, I'd rather go to one across the street. We do that naturally in every single space that we go into and that we access in, we begin to immediately be able to what we call perceive, which runs through cognition, fidelity. And we begin to perceive what it is we're at and is this a place where I want to be at? But once we identify that this place, after we've educated ourselves unconsciously or consciously, that we've educated ourselves that this is a virtual environment in which I want to be in, and this is a virtual environment which I feel like it's accepting of me, no matter the color, no matter the gender, no matter who I am, and that they've made this space accessible for me, now that I'm part of this environment, then comes to our fourth standard, which is community development. I've now accepted that I want to be at this place or at this restaurant. Now that I have taken my seat, I am now part of a community. Elisa, you look like a business. I am now part of a community. And now that I am part of this community, here's some of the important things I need to make sure that I've accept that I am accepted. I am part of this community. I've been asked to the table. I'm sitting down here with my party. And here we are in this virtual space, this environment, this classroom, this theater, call it what you will. Now that this has happened, the next step is my safety and privacy. This is the next step that we have in the standard of the seven standards of the metaverse. There's accessibility, there's educating myself in the environment. I feel comfortable and safe being there in terms of equality. I feel equal. I don't feel less than. There's inclusion, there's, 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 there's identifiability of the intersectional stance. Now I'm part of the community. Now this brings me into, do I feel safe? And is my privacy something that's of a consideration for this built environment? And then lastly, which is one of the most important standards that we have, which is the seventh is wellness. Nobody goes into a restaurant and says, I can't wait to have a really bad steak. I'm so looking forward to that. 
Nobody goes in there and says, I can't wait to have incredibly horrible tofu. It just doesn't happen. In fact, you go into this environment because you're expecting some type of growth, some type of edification, some type of nourishment, and that's when it leads us into wellness. Now, I said all of that to say in part that when we talk about the importance of accessibility, without accessibility, I don't experience any of those things whatsoever. So when we talk about extending reality, we must bring reality with it. And on the subject of intersectionality, that couldn't be more important because now we're thinking, okay, ecosystems, you know, often I know in Silicon Valley, we're really bad at it. We talk about ecosystems being a set of hardware and software, but ecosystems and a set of hardware and software, ecosystems are people. And we must get around to the understanding and product delivery teams that when we start talking about building technology for the ecosystem, in which ecosystem are we referring to? So it must be more people and culture inclusive. And that's a big obstacle and deterrent from greater accessibility. So now what we're identifying is that there's several different layers of accessibility, which I'm hoping to get into now with this discussion uh, with my co-moderators and for us to be able to explore and expand. I know there's a lot that could be said, but what we'll do right now is we'll turn it over to does anyone who's participating with us in this deep dive have any questions or anything that they'd like to contribute at the moment? It's not. What we're going to do is we're going to roll into questions that we have, and we're going to start with Dr. Taylor, and we're going to also have this in leverage for with Albert who's with us as well. And the first question that we're going to have is we're using this word. It's appropriate towards this particular deep dive that we have, intersectional. So Steve, before, we, before you ask the question, I want to acknowledge the hands that are raised. They just came up. So oh. You want to start there? Please. I just now saw that. Yeah. Uh, Josh, go ahead. Sorry about that. Allah Akbar, show up. Yeah, Allah. Hold on. Allah Akbar. It's a really good question, Josh. Okay, they've been kicked out. Um, if Dr. Air, would you like to go now? Have a question there for us? Does anyone have a question? Uh, Dr. Say, are you with us? Um, yeah, I, I am. You can hear me, right? We can, please. Okay, cool. Um, I'm, first of all, I'm, I, I'm really inspired by the, the seven uh, principles that you have. And I, I'm, I definitely think that accessibility is a real challenge. Um, one thing I'm a little bit curious about is because of the, the language barriers, and I know that some people are, are dealing a little bit more with uh, translations, are there specific things that you guys are advocating for um, in, in terms of like uh, ways of achieving some of those, those goals, like things that are kind of breakthroughs that have made it easier for uh, XR to be more accessible for others? I guess I'm just not as familiar with kind of the the research in uh, in equity or um, in improving accessibility for uh, like the the diverse number of people. Sure, Albert or Dr. Taylor, would you like to tackle that? Um, I think that's a really good question. Um, so basically, if I um, if I'm understanding correctly, you're talking about the uh, uh, multicultural uh, areas where English may not be the first language, right? Users who are trying to access uh, VR, AR, but uh, they may not uh, uh, speak English, for example. Yeah, yeah. so like uh -huh. I've seen instances where like people create a, just a simple web page, right? And, mm -hmm. and they have it in English, people book a spot. Yeah. Uh, and you look at all the people who are like being denied access to a place because they didn't book a spot. It's all 
non-English speakers, right? And、mm. so just the, the fact that everything is in English all the time is a huge barrier. It doesn't seem like it. it it's like equal、um, in the purpose of what they tried to create, but the effect. Was very not equal, and it was very much the non-English speakers that that got hit、uh, by this policy. Yeah, actually, you know, it's actually not just the language part, but if we actually a little broaden that part,、um, also、uh, multiculturally, some designs or symbols are not very uh, um, straightforward. For example, the music note.、Uh, it's it's a it may not be a very common. Uh, it's a Western uh, uh, music note, right? Like the the uh, bl- uh, black, the color with the、uh, dot, little dot, and、um, so、uh, that may not be very uh,、um, commonly used in in many other cultures. So that's a really good point in terms of、uh, that aspect. I think it's it's kind of. Noteworthy to bring up some effort from the W three C side. W three C Worldwide Web Consortium、um, is is the governing body that、um, uh, builds accessibility guidelines, right? The WCAG,、uh, WCAG is the accessibility guideline that、um, uh, all developers and designers we all kind of reference to, and it's like kind of like the The、uh, major reference point, and they have an accessibility standards, and、um, uh, and that is built by the working group, accessibility guideline working group, and one of the task force actually addresses this particular issue. And it's not just XR, it's not just XR or VR, AR, but I think this issue is actually beyond that.、Uh, even just on the websites or mobile apps, applications, softwares. Um, that、uh, a lot of it is in English, and、um, uh, the designs are not considering international、uh, cultures. So、um, they they do have a working groups that work on、uh, internationalization and、uh, working on、uh, building accessibility guidelines for multicultural、um, uh, users, and、um, and it is a known issue, but.、Uh, As far as I know, there isn't any、um, WCAG、uh, guideline that actually makes it a standard、uh, yet, even for web,、um, in terms of the language or in terms of the uh, uh, the、um, multicultural aspect.、Um, so that's a very new working group that is、uh, working on building accessibility guidelines for. Uh, this particular、uh, issue to address this particular issue. So even for web,、uh, it's very early on. So I, I, in terms of the status of where we are in terms of addressing that issue in XR, I'm like I personally think that it's even more behind than just the、uh, web 2.0.、Uh, so it's a it's a known issue, but there isn't any set standards yet because. Uh, it's it's a really new working group、um, that W three C is working on. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I I was wondering,、um, and this is something that I I'm not sure about. Like we talk about this at least in AI,、um, yeah. like there's a lot of people who are like the people who directly、um, exploited by AI systems, and、mm-hmm. to an extent, I was just curious what if I can ask, like how are the The people who are directly harmed by these types of systems、uh, included in the decision-making process when it comes to new standards or guidelines. Yeah. So actually,、um, W three C has.、Uh, I mentioned that the, there's a working group, but there's also、uh, something called community groups. So there's a. If you, I can share it on the Slack,、um, and the community group is for. Anyone and everyone to join, and they can、uh, directly work with these、uh, working groups and and the work that working groups are、uh, accessibility guideline working groups are working on,、um, and and、uh, they always try to hear the thoughts and 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 uh, uh, opinions of、uh, general public and anyone who's interested in、uh, contributing more. So they are always open for, and they actually want、uh, more contributions from. 
um, uh, people. So they do have community uh, group and uh, for different topics too. Um, uh, like for example, for cognitive and learning disabilities, there's community group and internationalization, uh, multicultural aspect, uh, there's a separate community group. So uh, I can share the website and then anyone can sign up, anyone can join and you can start attending uh, their regular meetings and directly contribute on uh, uh, with your lived experience and insights and share uh, what to uh, what needs to be more considered in, in building those accessibility guidelines. Dr. Taylor. I was, yeah, I was briefly um, just going to note how important your comment is. And from my side of it, which is more um, the academic research side, it's been something we've thought a, quite a lot about in the design implementation phase. So before things are even seen by the public or people with different identities, different um, say, uh, disabilities or different um, issues. Valerie, I have a question. Different um, is with different issues with access, et cetera. One moment, please. Um, will we have been attempting to have people come Excuse in? Excuse me, I have a question. Christopher, why are you so bald? Elisa, you look like Rumpelstiltskin. Anastasia, you look. Uh, sorry about that, everyone. Okay. It's like no uh, whack a mole, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've attempted to really work with different institutions and organizations to have people come in in the design phase of, the, of what we call Vera, to actually have people develop the system that we need to collect the data and have people in there. And so I just think one thing that is often not thought about until after things are completed and designed and implemented is, oops, everybody doesn't fit here, quote unquote, right? And so we're really working um, at the bottom floor, so to speak, to get people involved there. That means that we make an extra effort to reach communities that have often not been tapped into, work with community organizations, as well as institutions, universities, minority serving institutions, for example, and other um, organizations that can reach different communities that are often not thought about in this design phase. So it's um, interesting to hear Albert talk about it on the, on the side um, that he's been talking about it. And now kind of the complementary side um, from the research academic standpoint, how we're trying to address that as well. And we're really open always to hearing about more organizations that can be a part of this effort because we know we always are missing someone or some community that needs to um, also be tapped into. And, and since this is a more like a, uh, uh, like an actual group conversation. I also want to hear, I'm really, really uh, interested in hearing uh, uh, from you, Dr. Uh, doctor, uh, say uh, about what, what do you think could be really helpful um, for uh, people in multicultures and non-English speakers? What, what have you ever thought about or like what are some ideas that we could brainstorm now um, you know, like feel free to uh, share them if you have any ideas. Because I'm 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 from South Korea, and uh, English wasn't my first language, and I'm pretty passionate about this uh, topic too. And um, I'm trying to think about that too. So uh, it'll be really great to exchange our our thoughts here uh, since we have the opportunity. Yeah, like. It in, I'm not familiar as much with the metaverse, but I, I do know, like, I mean, there there are, you know, um, tens of thousands of people, like, collecting Axie Infinity coins in the Philippines. There's a million gold farmers um, in China that are collecting WoW gold. Um, there are, like, people in the global south that are also being part of, like, the labeling systems for AI um, that are the people who are directly, like, they're directly impacted. Uh, in in some ways, it's a, a new form of colonialism, and it feels like you know we're going to be repeating a lot of the mistakes uh, of the past if we just take people who are in positions of privilege and then we get them to decide what the policy is going to be, and we don't include uh, those specific voices of those people who are directly being exploited um, by these by these systems by big tech. 
Uh, and I, I'm a little bit like, that's that's the the only concern I have. I think that the people in this this team are are real advocates, and uh, I think that there's a good opportunity there. It's just tough. Like it, it's how do you how do you uplift a voice to that point where it could actually make a decision, as opposed to them just being the user of the solution that you provide. Right, and I'm wondering, uh, in particular to VR, for example, what would be some of the challenges uh, for uh, people who are non-English speakers in terms of design? Um, is there any known uh, 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 problems or uh, can you think of some issues um, possibly share? It's just common things with uh, with design. So it's the use of visuals. Um, how much reading do you need to do? Uh, like, are you able yeah. to see clearly? Um, and there's other things related to age and their ability to read. But uh, I, I, my understanding is like they're they're trying to do some stuff with like focal lens lenses and yeah. and stuff like that as well. Uh, but really, um, it's. It's a unique experience. I actually feel there's some good opportunities. I mean, in the metaverse, in VR, you are the person. So uh, we talk about like taking a, a walk in the person's shoes. Maybe there's opportunities to to do that, right? Like, you know, go in and experience what being a racialized person is like, as opposed to just being yourself, you know, um, take those opportunities to try to be somebody else in a different position and see what what that's like. Something that I can think about right now is um, like, for example, if um, uh, I, I guess, you know, one of the known accessibility issue for XR, VR uh, is where uh, in the, for example, for Oculus um, uh, space, and there's an app called Horizon uh, where people kind of uh, like, a, it's like a social platform where people uh, have their own avatar and uh, chat and hang out uh, in that space. Um, and one known issue for, um, for, uh, for, for deaf uh, users is um, where are we gonna put the subtitles or, or the captions? Um, well, uh, because like it's a 360 degrees uh, experience. And when you uh, look around, will that subtitle or uh, captions hide the other person's uh, avatar or a uh, certain object or, you know what I mean? So trying to think about these kind of issues. And um, for me, uh, that could be also applied uh, on a similar issue that uh, people who are non-native uh, English speakers can have. But actually, not just non-native English speakers, but everyone, right? Because like, if you are trying to talk to a Korean user in, in XR and you don't know Korean, then you will need a translate translation. But where will that translation appear in that space? Uh, can we, what would be the best design practice for that? And if we have that, uh, translated uh, subtitles um, uh, like at the bottom, will that hide the VR space, at, uh, hide a certain part of the VR space or will that experience be really good for users? So it's a really uh, uh, good question. And that's also something, a problem that I can think about right now. And um, yeah, I, I, I really love this uh, question. Thank you. Dr. Say, we really appreciate this question and, and certainly the feedback from uh, Albert and Dr. Taylor. Uh, I'll piggyback on what they just expressed to this degree. Uh, Albert, you just left off with a great point as far as dealing with virtual worlds and how we deal with the technology of occlusion and persistence um, and dealing with those two different narratives. But I think there's two things, the takeaways that I get from what Albert you just expressed and, and Dr. Taylor you just said, which I think are so complementary of one another, is that when you think about the design process, as Dr. Taylor talked about, going into the beginning of it, uh, that's where we set the tone. And that's when we start talking about the seven standards of the metaverse is that when we talk about the educational aspect, once we have access, we still need to have greater access once we're in these virtual environments, which is leading into what Dr. Say just expressed. We tend to think about the language barrier, 
as we're talking about now, but don't you know that design is a language itself? That ever before there were words in a movie, there was sound. Some of you may not remember, but, and this is certainly before my time, that there were once films made when films began that had no words. And it was all visualization and audio. And when we talk about what Dr. Taylor incredibly expressed is that the design schema, when I go into this virtual environment, is the person or people or cohorts that design this space, is there culture identifiability for me? You see, the more culture we have, it's not just for the sake of affirmative action. The reason, one of the reasons we want make to have more culture is that you want to hire the people that you want to buy your products. You want to be able to have someone go into an environment and there's familiarity in what they're seeing and what they're looking at, whether they're from Asia or South Asia or Europe, uh, South America, North America, Central America, the Pacific South. Transmetropolitan, continent to continent, when we go into these virtual environments, <clears throat> we will head into a point in time where we will refer to a virtual world as commonly as we refer to Manila or Austin. And it used to be a utopian consideration of these virtual worlds for people to want to build these spaces and for people to ingress into. And they said, well, that's fun. That's fine, Decentraland. We hear your utopian vision that you want to be able to have come in these virtual worlds. And oh, you said you, you're going to have a virtual world where people are going to buy real estate and buy properties. Yeah, okay. And, and they would laugh at that and, and they would say, the reason you can't do it, we, 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 it's, it's cool, but you can't do it because you don't have enough people. Well, good technology is superseded by great technology and great technology is superseded by even better technology, which we commonly refer here as the disrupt. But never have we been at a point in time where the greatest disruption contemporary at our time is a pandemic. So now we've become more virtual in the past 26 months than we have the 20, past 26 years. And now people are saying, well, wait, we can meet, we can congregate in virtual spaces, we can work, we have the power to cloud to be able to share. What else can we do in these virtual spaces? And this is what Dr. Say is talking about when it comes to NFTs. Now we've seen the prolific rise of what? Crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, and NFTs. Crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, and NFTs and blockchain, they're not new. They're not new. NFTs come around all the way back to 2011, BitDNS, color parties, counterparty, color coins, 2015, Ethereum, so forth and so on. What I'm getting at is that, back to Dr. Taylor's point, back to what Albert said. Taylor had to design, we need to tackle that head on, start off right, we end up right, or continue right. Albert brought a fantastic point, we talked about Technology becomes more advanced. What happens when the technology becomes more advanced than the technologist? Doctor say a great question because Albert said, hey, there's groups that are outside of these corporations or these platforms that are building these technologies that specifically are meant and formed to address to deal with these things because there's not enough hands on deck in your startup and in your corporation to tackle all these greater issues. And it is something that's been persistent in web two. Um, very powerful points that are expressed. Dr. Say, thank you for sharing that. Do we have any questions? Anyone else have any chime in or any questions that they'd like to share or even ask? Anastasia, we see you have your hand up. Please, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anastasia Divana. Um, so I'll, I'll put a very different spin on this. Um, also issues of you know, some of the issues that were brought up from a very different perspective of XR. Uh, so I work for a company that is making um, augmented reality glasses for blind people. So we want to help blind people see the world. Um, and there's just one version of AR, right? So like so far you've talked about virtual worlds a lot in metaverse, but like metaverse is it's also augmented reality. Uh, and the thing with augmented reality is that you know, a lot of the functionality and a lot of things that are going to make AR helpful is AI, right? And computer vision. Um, 
And AI, as we know, um, can be quite biased because you know your model is as biased as your data sets and data sets have been quite biased. Actually, too bad that Dr. Ed left because he, was, he mentioned AI. Um, but like the first thing, like, you know, we just started with our product and if I'm already running into like sort of ethical questions because, you know, if you're trying to tell blind people about describe other people that they see, right? Even the sighted person can be mistaken about somebody's gender uh, or race or, you know, think that like a larger woman is pregnant. Like we can make assumptions because of what we see. Now, if you add now the bias of, a model that was maybe not trained on every single race, you know, that for example, and you know, at least I know a few years ago, I don't know if that's been like got better, but for black women, it would often like misgender them because there wasn't enough data in the data sets. So what do we do now, right? If the model is telling us, hey, this is a black man, right? And and we, you know, we turn it to sound and it could be like completely wrong. And all we're doing, all we're trying to do is enable this person and give them kind of like the same access as a sighted person. But at the same time, we're running into an issue that now they're seeing through the eyes of a biased AI, right? So, you know, how do we deal with that? Any, any thoughts from anyone? Sure, I will, I will say this. And Anastasia, you bring up a great point that the world has become machine readable now. And with the power to AR cloud and avid rise of that, and coupled with augmented reality in general, I think it brings up to the same similar point that Albert expressed about persistence and occlusion. Um, when we talk about these headsets, a lot of people believe that headsets are ready and that they're completely at their zenith. And the reality is, is that headsets and the, and the idea for XR as a whole is that we're still in our infancy, that we've only developed sight it's still in the womb, but we have to start thinking about audio and touch. We have to start thinking about human factor development of perceptual uh, fidelity, cognitive fidelity, environmental fidelity, contextual fidelity, intentional and unintentional fidelity. The whole immersive experience of how we embody ourselves or embodiment within these virtual environments and especially with AR, which many are forecasting to be the grand champion of the two on the first run, if you will, when we start talking about the metaverse and the great adoption deployment, not just for devices, but with folks such as yourself that are working on AR glasses. Dr. Taylor, I have to ask from your lens, when we start talking about XR and we start talking about intersection, intersectionality, and we start talking about augmenting our world, and we're heading further into augmenting our world. What are the things that product teams, delivery teams, if they can sit with us now, say they get this video, see every major product delivery team in the world that's building AR, for example, what is it that they need to know about augmenting the world and what that will look like, not just for a few, but the whole and what they should be mindful of in their development practices? Well, I think, thanks for that question. It's a hard one. Um, but I think one important place to start that many people fail to recognize is the need for more humanities and social science scholars to be in the design product development phase. These are people who are trained and have um, learned quite a lot about the cultural spheres um, the environments in which people are embedded in and the pitfalls that we can quite easily run into when we are um, going off of um, data sets, right? As you noted, Anastasia, that have been normed with a particular population, in a particular population. And I think um, Silicon Valley and other places that are very technologically focused sometimes fail to step back a moment and actually um, value those sorts of expertise that can really help before the problems or um, circumvent or begin to design against the problems um, before they arise. And so I know that's sort of like a, um, a, a, a kind of a solution that's not 
exact, like this is the one thing we need to do, because I think it's a really collaborative process that has to be had. And one that for the business model, it's something that has to be um, accounted for financially at the beginning. So I think that's often a problem. You know, we bring in quote diversity consultants after everything has hit the fan, right? And it's um, often on the um, the defense, <laughs> right? Um, when the lawsuit has been filed, so to speak. Um, and so I just think that that is one thing that I have begun to see people in different tech sectors begin to value this, but I do not think it's been taken as seriously as it needs to be taken. And there's been a lot of writing by different scholars, especially literary, uh, library scholars that have begun to really push this seriously. Um, so I hope that starts to get at um, the issue you made with this. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. And Albert, I'm gonna rendezvous over to you. I, I, I have an important question that I, I, I hear the words design equity mm -hmm. and it, it's often being used, if not now more than ever. And I know that you have a focus on that, but I'm gonna do a tether of a tie-in, if you will, but also with neurodiversity and the neurodiverse community. From your lens, with what you work on and being an expert in these subjects, what should we be mindful of when we talk about design equity? Some things that Dr. Taylor brought up earlier. And when we start talking about the neurodiverse community, what does that look like? And what are you hearing from your lens for the XR community? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, but before I answer that, I also want to add on to what uh, Anastasia uh, has brought up. Um, so um, going back, um, uh, VR, uh, I mean, augmented reality space, AI is crucial uh, technology, but it lacks um, uh, diverse data. Uh, um, and that's a really good point. And I think um, uh, there are, I think, a few things that contribute to that. Uh, one of them is um, the producers, right? The, the people who are making those uh, uh, algorithms or who are involved in building those AI uh, may not be diverse, right? Um, and also, um, I mean, there's many reasons, but in general, uh, I, I think that currently uh, there is a huge lack of accessibility champions uh, uh, in, in companies. Uh, and, um, uh, I think recently I read a New York Times article saying there was a 70% almost uh, job uh, demand increase uh, in, in accessibility, um, but uh, it is not met. And also WebAIM, uh, uh, a blog, uh, pointed out um, mentioning that there's a huge lack of accessibility professionals uh, despite of the job growth, uh, job demand. Lack of supply, uh, to, uh, for the uh, amount of demand. So it is really one of the ways to address that is I, I think growing more, um, uh, more people uh, who are uh, trying to get into this accessibility or DI space, train them. So that's one of the role that I take with the uh, uh, accessibility next gen that I'm trying to do is, and it's not just accessibility professionals or experts, but just designers or uh, developers who are interested in learning about accessibility, but they don't really know where to go. You know what I mean? A lot of them don't know where to go. Um, so uh, building these kind of communities and uh, uh, spaces where people can freely join and learn uh, and, and, you know, because really educating those, uh, the, the people who are, uh, Was that mine or? Uh, I don't think we heard anything. Oh, I feel like I'm hearing something, but okay. Anyways, so um, yeah, it's it's the uh, it's the uh, producers or the people who are making um, uh, those technologies need to be educated and they need to uh, uh, learn more. So 
that is one uh, solution that, that we need to address. And um, also, uh, there, there are actually existing communities out there, uh, such as All Tech is Human. AI LA also uh, brought in a lot of, uh, uh, had a, had a uh, conversation around responsible AI. Um, they had a, like a, a, a conference for that. Um, so these are all really good questions and important issues uh, that people are working on, but there's a huge lack of uh, participation um, and huge lack of uh, experts or uh, leaders taking initiatives to really lead this kind of effort and try to get the people like, hey, you know, we need to, let's think about this together because, you know, uh, collective intelligence is, is, is better um, than just one person thinking alone. And um, also another thing that I want to address is user research, UX research aspect, because, you know, you, traditionally um, in the UX tech space, UX research hasn't been really uh, um, uh, very conventionally uh, popular uh, in, in the space, uh, right? So it's, it's been only recent that UX research kind of, even a job role called UX researcher uh, kind of became uh, a trend. But ServiceNow or uh, many companies have UX research team, but they many times don't really know what to do with them or uh, teams don't really, uh, you know, respect their work uh, sometimes or don't really see the value, but that is changing. So my uh, prediction is that uh, as we value UX, uh, the research more, user research more, um, and as we have more, as we bring in more diverse user panels, right, from the design phase, so we hear from diverse users with different multicultural backgrounds or different uh, abilities and intersectional um, um, uh, diversity, then we can uh, start building products from the design phase more uh, comprehensively uh, uh, um, uh, equitable uh, and diverse. So that's kind of my, my take on it. And in terms of um, addressing the, uh, the design aspect for neurodiverse uh, uh, users is um, addressing Chris's uh, question is um, one of the common thing is that actually um, the W3C COGA task force does have a supplemental guidance, but it's not very popular, uh, as much as popular as um, WCAG guideline because everyone focuses on legal compliance. So we have to look at WCAG uh, to meet the 2.1 AA standard, right? <laughs> But not a lot of people miss out the fact that there are many supplemental guidance that is not part of this uh, meeting legal requirement or this uh, standards, but that exists, right? So people only read what I have to read, but not really uh, the actual other works that are being created. Um, so Koga Task Force has uh, content usable, it's a supplemental guidance and it talks about um, one of the things that it talks about is plain language. Uh, um, so the accessibility is not, uh, design is not just visual. There's a, uh, a user experience part, but also content, uh, right? So we tag also is 30%, almost 30%, 26% content. So um, for users with cognitive and learning disabilities or mental health disabilities, it is really important to be, uh, when, you, when you are writing something, it's not ambiguous. Uh, it's, it's very clear and uses plain language. And actually government also requires that any government uh, information to be uh, written in plain language so that uh, general public can understand uh, the social services uh, that are available for them. Um, so what plain language addresses is 
using less jargons and metaphors uh, that are um, metaphors that are uh, uh, that you need a contextual understanding, right? But you may you might be from different cultures, so you might not be able to understand that context, right? So things like that uh, is one example, one very example, clear instructions. Um, and another important part is um, uh, moving and focus change. Uh, when something is, uh, when too many things are moving in your vision and your focus, you, you don't feel, um, uh, you don't feel that you're in control of your focus. Uh, it can cause a lot of dizziness and uh, trigger uh, many uh, disability episodes as well. Um, uh, so it is important to um, address that um, uh, th the moving and focus change that users have to feel that they are in control. Um, so that is another example. I can go on and on and on, but I don't want to delay too much. So uh, I'll toast it on to uh, Chris. And I, I think Scott also raised the hand. So um, yeah. Hi, Scott. If you can, and thanks for sharing, Albert and Anastasia. Uh, Scott, please, the floor is yours. Um, D Dylan, are you, wait, is Dylan ahead of me? Or, uh, okay. I I did have just a, a few oh, quick sorry, comments because I know we only have, I think, two minutes left. Um, but just really quickly as some food for thought, uh, I want to say first, Valerie, when you talked about um, the cultural sensitivity is damage control, I think accessibility gets treated so much the same way. Um, although often there's that it's uh, just too little too late rather than thinking from the start. Um, I was wanted to say, I, I'd, I'd be very curious to have a follow-up conversation when we talked about different cultures having different um, expectations when it comes to user interface. I know one thing that could go into that a lot is in English, we read left to right, but that's not universal, right? And so I don't actually know, but I'm curious now in other countries where there's a different reading order, does that mean like all of your navigation and stuff would be on the right instead of the left? Um, I think that's something that's really worth exploring or thinking about, especially how we are adapting those into XR that has a lot of kind of real world parallels when you're designing the interfaces for it. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to, to say, I, I'm very curious. We talked about this, this problem of AI not having good data on underprivileged or intersectional groups. Um, but the, I think there might be a tension between wanting to gather that data that we would need but respecting people's privacy, because oftentimes marginalized groups are the ones who have the most to risk from their data getting stolen and abused. Uh, and so I'd love, to, you know, we don't, I don't think we have time right now, but um, either on Slack or in our main XR access uh, feed, uh, I'd love to to discuss some of those those thorny challenges, because it's definitely something we'll need to, to, to fix these problems going forward. And with that said, Scott, do you want to ask a quick question or have a quick statement with the just final? Just a quick comment, and I just posted in chat too, and I could write more in there since I know we're running out of time, but I'm just glad the neurodiversity focus uh, came up because that's one of the examples where the intersection piece has not been emphasized as far as diverse races, ethnicities, gender, gender identity, socioeconomic status, uh, sexual orientation, et cetera. Very white male. I, I hate to say that I embody a lot of that stereotype we have around cognitive disabilities at times on, on advocacy. So I'm, I'm glad that we're thinking broadly on different disability types when we're talking about this equity piece and how it fits into the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, which is a major priority just as a briefing here for us in the federal government, a US Department of Labor Office Disability Employment Policy. So we're the agency that funds Pete and um, that DEI piece is major uh, executive policies that we've been driving forward. So the conversation here has been wonderful and I'm glad to be a part of the engagement here. And thanks for having me in this, uh, including me here. And I'll, I'll add more into the Slack channel later on since we're out of time. And on that note, um, we want to say thank you, thank you, Scott, for your comment. And thanks, thank you everyone for attending to Intersectional Equity and XR, Dr. Taylor, Albert, Thank you for your questions, Anastasia, your attendance, Alyssa, 
Dylan, and everyone else. We hope that this has been an edifying session with you and we sure look forward to hearing more post feedback and share and seeing how you'll build a greater equitable experience and extended reality in the hard work that you do. Thank you. And we'll conclude to the main room. Thank you so much, Thanks, everybody. everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. very much, everyone. And yeah, stick around until uh, 2 p.m.